That is awesome. Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. Don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at another one of Nile Red's videos, simply called Aluminum and Mercury. I think he's going to do some type of crazy amalgamation experiment. Let's take a look. Mercury forms alloys with most metals in a process known as amalgamation. Last week, I messed around and tested it's it. It's just out like watching it go by itself. And it was pretty cool. This time, though, I'm going to see what happens when I add it to aluminum. It's supposed to be quite destructive, which is why you're not allowed bringing mercury on a plane. So, I went to Home Depot, and I bought a strip of aluminum. That's cool. I cut out a small section and drilled a hole about halfway through. This little crater is important because mercury is super annoying and without it, it would just slide off the plate. Under normal conditions, aluminum is surrounded by a protective oxide layer. Metallic mercury isn't able to penetrate through this barrier, so it kind of does nothing. Mercury is one of the most fascinating liquids. Super toxic, very, very dense. There's a reason why you use mercury in pressure gauges. There's even, even a unit in inches of mercury, like for our, uh, the main condenser at a nuclear power plant, is measured in inches of mercury for how much vacuum is in there. To give you a sense, um, atmospheric is about uh, 30. So 28, 29 inches vacuum. So there you're going opposite. You're going below atmospheric to measure how much of a vacuum you have in the condenser. That is an almost perfect vacuum. If you're going to use water instead of mercury, it would have to, your, your gauge would be taller than the building. <laughs> I, I'd have to look it up off the top of my head, but I think one inch of mercury is equivalent to over a meter of water or something like that. But that's one of the things about, about mercury. It just kind of sticks there. Like you said, it's very slippery in that it would go off of a bunch of uh, metallic surfaces. It's one of the fast, most fascinating things to look at, but handle with care. Sometimes it's possible to get things going by manually scratching away <laughs> the oxide layer. I tried doing this about two Mechanical or three times, agitation. but it wasn't Technical working term. for me. I even tried to brute force things using a drill, but that didn't get things going either. I thought that maybe it was just super slow to get started, so I went to lunch and I left it for about an hour. When I came back, nothing had changed, so clearly I have to use a different strategy. Instead of trying to remove the oxide layer mechanically, I'm going to try to do it chemically. Okay. So I took out all the mercury and I added some dilute hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid quickly reacts with the oxide layer and dissolves it away. This exposes fresh aluminum metal, which also reacts with the acid. Uh, it mentions oxidizing and aluminum. This makes me think of a different type of cladding design. So one of the scary things that can occur and why people don't like, uh, one of the many reasons why people don't like loss of coolant accidents in a nuclear power plant is the oxidation and interaction between zirconium and water. Now, zirconium is used as a cladding for the nuclear fuel. So the, the, the fuel, uh, uranium oxidite, is surrounded by this zirconium, or it's a, it's a zirconium alloy. And that alloy is pretty, pretty good at doing what it's doing. It's very heat resistant. It's very secure in terms of accommodating for the swelling that is created by fission products for the, from the fission in the nuclear power plant. But the cladding does have a potential to react with water at extremely high temperatures. Um, and by high temperatures, I'm talking cladding temperature in excess of 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. And note that I mean the cladding temperature. It's not the fuel temperature. The fuel's going to be even hot, has to be even hotter than that in order to heat the cladding to that temperature. Uh, so this would be loss of coolant accident um, and no cooling for a while. It takes a while. We've done scenarios like this in the simulator for for a considerable length of time. And we're talking we're talking minutes to hours. And there's a reason why we have a whole bunch of emergency backup pumps to supply 
emergency sources of water to keep the uh, core cooled and covered. Because when Zircaloy interacts with the water, it releases hydrogen gas. So in addition to, so forget the meltdown part, forget the fuel melting, because that's not going to go mess with, because um, that's not going to escape the reactor containment building. But when you have hydrogen gas, it can become volatile, which there are even defensive measures against this, uh, such as hydrogen recombiners. And these recombiners basically turn the hydrogen and the oxygen inside the containment building back into water. And it's going to be steam with the extreme amount of temperatures it would require to cause this reaction and to generate that kind of water. This, at this point, containment is a hellish environment of high pressure and high temperature. Nobody's in there during this type of accident. That's the concern. It creates hydrogen. Hydrogen explosions occurred in Chernobyl. Chernobyl did a whole bunch of other things wrong in addition to that, but that's one of the ways to defend again is a, it's a hydrogen recombiner. Now that's where aluminum comes in. An iron, chrome, aluminum alloy cladding is more resistant to that sort of hydrogen buildup effect and the heat. So that one is being considered for newer designs. Always trying to make things safer, as safe as possible. I let it go for about a minute and then I get rid of the acid. With the acid gone, we'll start to reform the oxide layer, so it's important to add the mercury quickly. The amalgamation started almost right away, but it's really hard to see. In the reflection, okay. you can see me lean over to get very a small look, hairs. and what I noticed some it? very small hairs forming between the aluminum and the mercury. In real time, this process is really slow, so I set things up for a time lapse. So the major thing going on here is the combination of the mercury with the aluminum to form the amalgam. Some of the <laughs> that amalgam that so forms cool. gets dissolved in the mercury Look at and it take makes off. its way to the top. When it gets there, it comes in contact with oxygen in the air and it reacts to form white aluminum oxide. This part of the process is pretty short-lived though that out. because it quickly gets covered and protected by the oxide. This prevents fibers from growing directly from the mercury, but obviously they continue going out from the sides. This happens because some of the mercury is dissolving into the aluminum. The amalgam here also reacts with air to form the oxide, but okay. the difference is that it doesn't shut itself down. The Just gonna keep going until you run out of material. along the surface, probably the mercury, and amalgamate more aluminum. In theory, this process should keep going until the entire surface is covered with a thick layer of the oxide. <laughs> the mercury could also penetrate deeper into the aluminum and compromise its strength, but I think that takes a really long time to do. <laughs> Just made a cone. About four hours later, I decided to end the time lapse. I spun the thing around, and when I noticed the other side looked a lot cooler, I was a little bit sad. <laughs> anyway, when I poke at it, you can see that it's not structurally very strong. I'm not sure what sure. I was expecting, but I was surprised at how fragile it was. Oh, wow. It looks like there's quite a bit of aluminum oxide here, but surprisingly... If someone would have showed me a picture of that, and say if this is metal, nylon, or some type of fiber, I would have lost that bet. But yeah, someone with no context. There's only about 200 milligrams. I went to clean things up a little, so I scraped away a lot of the oxide. On the edges, this reveals fresh aluminum mm. amalgam, Nothing which is nice. the silver stuff that you see. As usual though, it quickly reacts and turns gray again. As I said before, some of the mercury has dissolved into the aluminum. I was really curious to see how much more amalgamation would occur if I took away all the visible mercury. So I removed the large drop and I cleaned things up. Okay. I then left it out and did another time lapse over the course of a couple that hours. That is so cool. There was apparently enough left to get a decent amalgamation going, but it was actually <laughs> less than I was expecting. I cleaned things up again, and this time when I scraped the edges, they're not silver like before. If you haven't seen our already, I did a couple of reaction videos to his geranium glass video, and one of them was of his video on the cleanup. I just love how he shows these detailed processes. I'll pin a comment down below 
please check it out if you haven't already seen those. Clearly the amalgamation process is done. I think the reason that it stops is because all the mercury that's present is amalgamated with aluminum, but it's hidden under the oxide layer. Without the main drop in the middle, we don't have excess mercury to creep out and continue making more amalgam. It also might be possible that small amounts of mercury are taken away as the fibers grow, but I don't know if that actually happens. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and react things again because I want to highlight yeah. something. So like before to get things going, I clean it up with some hydrochloric acid. Then I add the mercury back, but this time, instead of doing things dry, I add some water. Mm, okay. This prevents any cool oxide fibers from forming, but I want you to notice is the bubbling that's occurring. Oh, let's talk about mercury and cooling. Did you know that mercury was actually used as a coolant in a very weird nuclear reactor? This little assembly is from a reactor called Clementine. This was back in the 1940s. It was a fast reactor. And one of the things about a fast reactor is you're going to need much higher enrichment. In most typical reactors, like a pressurized water reactor that I worked at, fast neutrons account for almost a statistically insignificant number of fissions. But mercury was used because of its extremely high density, so it could effectively cool something that small. This was a small prototype ex experimental reactor that never saw commercial production. Fast neutrons never really took off in, in the U.S. Their advantages, I mean, they sound cool. I mean, when you, when you want a fast reactor over a slow reactor, after all, uh, more, more neutrons are produced. Um, temperatures can be higher, so that could potentially raise the uh, thermal efficiency. And a lot of transuranic elements can actually fission using a fast neutron, so not as much nuclear waste is produced. But they have some disadvantage. Using a molten metal like mercury or liquid sodium in a fast reactor, refueling's a lot more of a pain. <laughs> Trying to cool down something that and potentially reuse it. No, that's that's way, way more difficult and and way, way more expensive. Uh, so the op so your your operating costs are gonna go through the roof. And that's probably the biggest thing, because even using light water reactors and dealing with the nuclear waste is just a lot is a lot less expensive than a fast reactor though i'd i'd really like to see more of them used but this particular one that used mercury that's pretty out there and <laughs> i don't know if we'll ever see one that used mercury again but it, just letting you know it was used as an experiment fast neutrons uh they also have a greater potential of having a positive void coefficient if you don't know what that is, watch my reaction to the Chernobyl series where I talk a lot more about that. The reactions are faster, that can be a disadvantage. Uh, less percentage of delayed neutrons, so you're, you're going to have a much more coarse adjustment whenever you operate your control rods. Instead of reacting with air, it's reacting with the water here to form aluminum hydroxide and hydrogen gas. I was initially only expecting bubbles to come from below the mercury, but they're actually coming from everywhere. What this tells me is that there was still some amalgam present, and it was just trapped under the gray oxide. It's hiding. When I went to clean up the mercury <laughs> this time, it was actually more of a pain than usual. Some of it got stuck to the side, and I wasn't able to get it out. Instead uh -oh. of letting it go to waste though, I just decided to do another time lapse. And I'm glad I did, because although this one is shorter, I think it's cooler than the first Whoa. one. That is awesome. <laughs> oh, it fell over. <laughs> when it was done, I cleaned it up. It just looked like some big yeti was sticking its hand up through the ground. That's awesome. Just like the last one, but there were still some little mercury bits left over. I think they were just covered with way too much oxide and weren't really able to interact with the aluminum. I was curious to see how much damage was done, so I cut the plate in half. When I take a look on the side, it doesn't look like it went deep at all, and it was really just surface level. It didn't look like it took much effort to I cut it. I cleaned up one of the sides, 
and we can see that again, Said it, it, made it more really brittle. didn't do that much damage. I imagine to really destroy the aluminum, the mercury would have to sit there for quite a long time, or we would have to continually remove the oxide that forms. In terms of its application, aluminum amalgams are commonly we'll used in foil. chemistry for reduction <laughs> reactions. As we saw earlier, metallic mercury wasn't amazing at attacking the aluminum, so for these reactions, we usually use a soluble mercury salt. The general idea here is that mercury keeps exposing fresh aluminum, which really likes to donate electrons. A somewhat common but highly illegal use of this reaction is in the production of MDMA. Ooh. Anyway, Don't I think drugs, that's kids. about it for this video. That was a fascinating experiment. I, I especially liked the one at the end where the Yeti hand looked like it was coming through to get you. <laughs> That's awesome. Let me know if you want me to look at any more of Now Red's videos or if there's any others. I really enjoy these. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.